Welcome to the Block Party. My name is Seth Kushner. Today, I am joined by the Lightning's fifth round pick in 1992, but that's not what's interesting about him. Brant Myers, author of Painkiller, a memoir of big league addiction. I've got multiple books here. Brant, welcome to the show, man. Hey, man. How are you? I'm doing good. So I want everybody to know that um, I first sent Brant a friend request on Facebook. Then we moved the relationship over to Instagram. And now here we are meeting on Zoom for the block party. That's just the gradual, you know, steps of this relationship. I can't wait to see where it goes from here. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Brent, I know that you've talked a ton about the book. So I want to talk a little bit outside of the book before we dig in. Uh, Joe Manginello, Manginello, Mr. Sofia Vergara. I, I don't even yeah. know how to pronounce his name. He's the world's sexiest man. And I saw <laughs> he was reading your book. When did you meet him? How did you become friends with Joe? Oh, Joe, it's, it, man, that was a while back in Los Angeles when I, I think I was in my, my third treatment center. Um, maybe even my second, actually, I, I can't remember. Was he there? But, uh, no, so, so Joe, um, Joe, me and Joe met through um, uh, a couple sober friends. And uh, he was, uh, you know, sort of on the same journey as me trying to resurrect his career, he finished Spider-Man. And, uh, and then, um, you know, again, he was just on that journey and we, we clicked and then I was boxing twice a week and I needed a partner. And I said, Hey, big man, you want to go down and, and box? And, and, uh, he said, sure. So anyways, we became really good buddies. And then all of a sudden he got this role in uh, true blood. And, uh, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> Who was, who was, uh, who could hit harder? You or Joe when you guys would spar together. Oh man, that guy's a big guy. Like he's six, five, you know, two thirty, I think. Um, so we, our trainers said no headshots, but we're so competitive that we had to, we had to land the odd one in there. So, uh, <laughs> isn't that great it was though? fun. Isn't it great though? Cause you said you kind of connected. I feel like, you know, as we all get older, it's harder to find that connection with people. You know, we tend to hold on to our friends that have, you know, been there through childhood or earlier in our, our lives. So isn't it great when you can find somebody that you kind of connect with as an adult? Oh, for sure. And, you know, we were sort of around the same age and, um, and again, it was cool because when I met Joe, um, you know, like I said, he was sort of just starting to resurrect everything. And then once I saw the trajectory of his, uh, of his success, it was really, really cool to watch. It was just another reminder though. I remember we went for sushi one time and this is after he, you know, I think he was already in the magic Mike movie and, uh, we went for sushi and he was wearing these old work boots, like, I mean, raggedy old work boots. And, but he had a really like expensive leather coat on and the boots just didn't match. And I'm like, dude, what's with your work boots? You know, he goes, Brant, he says, I, every time now that I go to an audition, I wear these work boots because it reminded me of when I was shoveling, I think he was doing cement or, or, or construction in Los Angeles looking for an acting job. So he just said it, it gives me a reminder uh, every time I look down and see my feet. That's strong. That's strong. That's a good reason to wear those shoes. So <laughs> tell me, Brent, back in 1992, you're drafted by the Lightning. Also that year, Roman Hamerlich was drafted number one overall. Uh, the Lightning also drafted Brent Gretzky, I, I believe, in the third round. You were in the fifth round. Did Phil Esposito call you? How do you find out you're drafted back in 1992? Is it a fax? Do you have to wait at home for the landline call? How you, How'd you get the news? Oh, no, buddy. I was at the draft. Oh, were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I was in Montreal. Like, actually, funny story. I was rated to go in the second round that year by Central Scouting. So my agent at the time flew my parent, my, my dad and my grandparents and my sister share down. And uh, it was in Montreal. It was an amazing experience. Um, I didn't think I was going to get picked because all the Europeans went that year. And uh, they were eligible to come over. So I got bumped back to, uh, I believe it was the first pick in the fifth round. So what was that like? What did you think about Tampa Bay when you were selected? Did you, did you know anything about Tampa Bay? Did you go, man, I don't need hockey is not going to work there. This too, it's too down south for me. What were your first thoughts? <laughs> oh, my first thought was Brent Gretzky. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like wow like okay there's Wayne and then you know there's Brent and I knew what Brent was doing in junior and all that kind of stuff and um I looked up to I looked up to him you know and uh 
we actually hit it off uh, in in our first training camp and and became really good friends. Um, I knew it was warm. I mean, I was uh, coming from Grand Center, Alberta, which was just a little town. Um, but it was such a cool experience back then. Uh, we we had our training came out training camp out at Lakeland or something yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was just really, really uh, an awesome time. <laughs> Is there anything in the book, because you've been doing the book tour right now for a little while, is there anything that you felt like you left out of your book that as soon as, you know, it went to print, you go, oh my God, like I should have told this story. Anything that popped in after you put out the book? <laughs> well, actually, the, the the one that you have in your hands is a PG uh, rated version. Um, there was a lot of stuff I took out of there. Really? And it, yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was just, uh, you know, the... Uh, I guess it would be the legal team <laughs> looked at it and said, and said uh, we those. should <laughs> we should remove uh, some of these uh, stories and um, which was absolutely fine. But yeah, no, there's nothing that I would have put more into the book. What do you do right now to stay sober daily? I know that it's not easy, and you've been sober for a long time now. What what do you do every single day to to stay on that that path? Well, I think for me, I, I, there's some things that I've never missed in 13 years, which, uh, you know, it sounds silly, but in, in my last treatment center, I got into a good, um, a good rhythm and uh, small things like waking up and making your bed. And uh, I have a little uh, prayer meditation book that I read from every morning. Um, I usually get on a call with another couple of sober buddies uh, that are in Los Angeles. Um, man, I've done that. I've done that like for over a decade. Wow. Every day or just yeah. about every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah See, I've never, it, never missed. Know. It's not easy. You can't just wake up and be sober. You have to put in the work to do it. Oh yeah. And there was a, you know, they told me, they said, uh, sobriety is not for pussies. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't really know what they meant. Um, but looking back, it for sure has been one it definitely one of the hardest but yet easiest things I've ever been through hardest because there is still something inside of me that really misses getting loaded and I uh, I loved alcohol like I love my favorite Chinese food restaurant you know or, or uh, an old girlfriend uh, it's a love affair that I've had uh, and drugs too so it's a it's a, as they say, I'm not one of those guys that go, I'm cured because I'm not, I, I look at my day today and if I can lay my head down on the pillow when I go to sleep uh, and I'm still sober, then it's a, it's another win. What was a normal game day like for you back in the day? Was it, I know that you would do cocaine till early in the morning. Would you drink before every game? Were you on cocaine? What was just a normal mm. average game day like for you? Oh, no, game days were fine. Yeah, I might be a bit hungover, but I, you know, uh, I was never doing drugs the the day of the game or anything okay. like that. Yeah, no, it was, it was post, it was post game that we'd get at it. Was it, do you feel like it was like, there'd be a high of playing in front of people or playing hockey. And then it's like, you get done and you go, what do I do? And you feel like that's part of what you were chasing or you just really enjoyed partying and getting loaded. Like you said. No, there's. In the, in the role that I had, I had to somehow um, reward myself. And the reward was, okay, if I'm going to go out here in front of, you know, 18, 19,000 people and put my life on the line, um, then I want to go to a certain club or a certain bar and, and let loose and sing and dance and drink and, and not think about maybe who we're playing tomorrow night or a couple of days down the road, because that inevitable was coming as well. Did any players or coaches know how deep it was going with you? Or did they just think that you were just another guy having a good time after the games? Oh, no, they, they had an idea. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there is a reason why I signed seven different NHL contracts, I believe. Uh, you know, um, I guess they saw something in me, though, that they wanted to keep taking a chance. And, and thank God for, for people like Daryl Sutter, um, that would always sort of dangle a carrot in front of me saying that if you, you know, complete stage three or complete stage four, uh, which seemed impossible at the time, but that there was a contract waiting for me. 
I, I want to put this out there because I think that this is uh, awesome. And I'm not sure how many people know this. The NHL, they, they paid it for you to go to rehab, right? Was it all the times or was it the fourth or fifth time? They paid for all five. All five times. Yeah. So they banned you for life, but they did say, hey, we're going to take care of this. How much did that mean to you? Well, it's it's still something that I hold dear to my heart now. It's uh, it's uh, the only way that I can repay that debt is to give back to others and uh, for myself to stay sober um, because it's uh, that type of, you know, especially on the fifth, the fifth one, when I was out of hockey for two years and they already told me that they were washing their hands of me um, and there was no more money left, um, you know, for them to do that was, uh, was incredible. Now a lifetime ban, does that mean that you can never play? Cause I know that you worked for the Kings in 2015. Is that what the lifetime ban means? Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't play in uh, North America again. Is it is it still yeah. on you right now? Oh yeah, that's yeah. There's no. <laughs> so there, there was no stage five. Stage five was a lifetime ban. So once I relapsed after stage four, and I was going harder than ever, uh, we all knew that that was it. That was the end of the road. Um, but it was uh, sort of cool that I got hired by a corporation that gave me a lifetime ban. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that like? I know the story of you getting emailed and you hopping on a plane and going to LA, but what to get that chance to go back and to especially be in that role with the Kings again, what, what did that mean for you? Wow. It was uh, sort of surreal. I mean, because I, I spent, I think, six years of sending proposals to the National Hockey League and, and the, the, the Players Association. Um, so when the email came through and I flew to L.A., as I write about in the book, I, um, I inserted some of my journal uh, pieces in there, of really how I was feeling at that moment. And I wanted the readers to really get a, a true feeling of what I was going through. And I don't, I think... Anytime that you can release a journal, uh, people know that it's really coming from the heart and it's there's no blankets on it. Did you always have money for drugs or did it get tough towards the end for you? Oh, no. At the at the end, there wasn't a lot of money. I remember I called the, the league and I'm like, um, hey, I'd like to cash in my retirement. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? You're supposed to take it when you're 60. And I'm like, listen, man, I got a cell phone bill that I got to pay. <laughs> I'm like, I am, I'm not worried about 60 years old right now. So they're like, well, okay, uh, you know, if you take it now, um, you know, it's only going to be, it was literally peanuts. Yeah, but, but you were like. But to, like, me at the, to me at the time, it was like, let's do it. So I cashed it in in 2006. <laughs> That's how they should have known that there was something going on if they didn't know along the way that you were calling them for that. Uh, tell, tell everybody, I, I obviously know what happened, but can you tell everybody what happened at your sister's house? And was that your rock bottom? Yeah, that was a rough night. Um, because up until that point, um, you know, the cocaine never made me black out. I would uh, snort a line or two or three or whatever it may be. And um, it would almost make you alert, um, sort of wake you up from the drunk. But that night, I, I joke about it, say my, my Coke dealer saved my life because he didn't call me back. And I, and I couldn't get a hold of him. And so I started drinking all the booze in, the, in my sister Cher's uh, house. And around, us, around 7 o'clock, the lights went out. And I don't... I don't remember anything uh, other than the, other than uh, I, I was in the snow. I know that it was in January, I believe, or no, it was February because I got sober the next day. And uh, I just remember my hands were handcuffed and, and, and my sister was crying and stuff. And I didn't know what happened. And uh, they took me home and she took pictures of what I did to the home and uh I think at that, at that point, it was a realization that I was really on my way to prison or dying. How did your daughter change your life? And how is your, your relationship with her today? Oh, Chloe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's crazy that, uh, you know, I didn't see her for, I think eight months. And, um, when I first took the blanket off of her face, you know, she gave me a, a really big smile with these blue eyes and 
I don't know. I was just so proud of the fact that I hung in there. And I mean, I know, I know at that time I was only eight months sober, but um, looking at her, it really gave me motivation to keep going. And nowadays, like pre COVID, we, we always fly to LA and uh, we take our birthdays together. So I would take my sobriety birthday. She'd give me a cake and then, <clears throat> and then I'd give her a cake for her belly button birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, how, how old is she now? Is she, was she 13? Yeah. So she the... looked, have you talked to her about some of the things you've been through? I mean, she, it, the book's out right now. You said the PG version, but what, what yeah. does she know about your battle and what you had to go through to get to this point? Well, I sort of told her, Hey, you know, you're, you're still obviously really young. If you want to dive into the book, skip the first 150 pages. <laughs> and, uh, and well, you know, she's going to read them now twice. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I, at least I had to say it. Um, what you're going to read about your dad is um, some of those things are probably hard to read, but um, it, it got me to where I am today. And, and you know what, Chloe, you've never seen your daddy loaded. Um, I've always been there for you, no matter what. And, uh, I think that down the road, not now, she doesn't understand what's happening. Uh, I think down the road when she gets older, she might. Well, it's just good to be honest with them and, you know, not treat them like kids. And I like the way that you kind of addressed with her and just told her to skip parts of the book, which, you know, she's going to read those parts the hardest, um, in the NHL right now, or, or sports that, you know, of, are there programs in place to, to help people that are going through things. I know you said 10% of a people, 10% of people are you know, addicted to something. It could be one or two guys on every single team across sports. Are mm -hmm. there programs in place across the board that you know of? I'm not familiar with uh, actually in the national football league. The, one of the reasons why Dean Lombardi wanted to get this on board was because they had somebody in place for the la last 10 years called the player, uh, not assistance, but uh, I can't remember what it was. Um, anyways, so the so the NFL does have it. Uh, the NHL uh, currently has um, one team. The Calgary Flames are doing it. Um, and that's it. That's all I know of. Wow. I mean, you think that's an issue? You'd have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Has anybody reached out to you that read your book that, you know, maybe you had forgotten about somebody from your past that, you know, didn't know your story that goes, oh, man, I had no idea what you're going through at the time. Oh, tons, tons of messages from people going. Uh, just so they didn't realize how, how deep it went for me. You know, on the surface, I was acting like everything was fine. Um, but deep down, obviously, as the reader will see that I was slowly slowly dying away and they didn't understand they didn't know that part of brand how tough would this have been for you if you were playing in the tmz era and the social media era where you could have been who knows people taking pictures of you with your coke dealer or partying too hard uh, do you ever think about what it would have been like if this was happening i don't know say now well we'd probably be having this meeting uh, separated by some glass <laughs> <laughs> And that's no joke. <laughs> so true story. Yeah, I know. I don't doubt yeah. it. How, how important is it to you to, to keep a sense of humor about this? It's obviously very, oh, yeah. very serious stuff. But yeah. I mean, you, you have no issue, you know, kind of poking a little bit of fun when you can. Oh, no, I, man, I, I laugh at myself every day. You know, it's, I have to, I have to go, wow. Like, you know, when I read the book, it, it took me into a different, um, realm of uh I, I i guess uh it was a spiritual process for me because I, I i i wrote it and stuff but i didn't read it until it was finished in my hands uh because the editing was just it was a long process um but yeah no i have to i have to look at it uh with a little bit of humor do you think that's the best form of therapy you've ever done is writing your book and telling your story and now you know sharing it with other people Oh yeah. I mean, listen, I, I was really proud of my first goal. I was proud of my first fight. I was proud of a lot of things, but I, I think now looking at, uh, the book, um, it's for sure the most proud I've ever been in my life. And I, and, and I don't mean that selfishly. I mean that the messages that I've received from people, um, that said that I've, that I've helped them 
um, is a bit overwhelming. And I think that hopefully, uh, you know, the book can reach more people because we're not talking about just 700 players in the National Hockey League. We're talking about millions of people that are suffering and that this is a pandemic in itself uh, that affects all ages. Um, it just doesn't kill the elderly. Brant, thank you so much. Author of Painkiller, make sure you check it out. Brant and I were able to figure out, mostly because of him, uh, the time difference between Florida and Edmonton today. We got it <laughs> two hours. Brant figured that out. Thank you so much. Make sure you pick up the book, everybody. And thanks for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Awesome, buddy. Thanks, man.